And everybody said, yeah. and Welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. Yeah. I praise the Lord for the privilege He has given me uh, to share the truth and teach the truth and impart the truth unto you. And I appreciate your being here. And I pray that your being here will not be in vain in Jesus' name. The Lord will lead you further and lead you higher as he instructs us and teaches us in the weed, in the word, in the work of God in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your love, and for your wisdom, the preservation of your word that you have given to us. And we thank you, Lord, because you grant us the illumination, the instruction, the inspiration of the Spirit of God that will declare the truth so that everyone will have the truth, possess the truth, believe the truth, and live by the truth. And on the final day, we'll be with you in glory in heaven, in Jesus' name. Teach us today, enlighten us today, and show us, Lord, the great areas of our lives that we need to put right under the blood of the Lamb so that our lives will match your revelation in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can see that we're coming to Galatians chapter 3. And tonight we're studying from verse 1 all through to verse 9. Please open your Bible, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Look at verse 9. In verse 9, it says, So then, they which be of faith, are blessed with faithful Abraham. Now you'll see as you compare verse 1 and verse 9. In verse 1 it says, O foolish Galatians, O thoughtless Galatians, O carnal Galatians, O traditional Galatians, who has bewitched you, who has deceived you, who has turned you away from the truth that says foolish, thoughtless, carnal, fleshly, traditional. It says you have been derailed from the truth that you should not obey the truth, believe the truth, embrace the truth, stand in the truth. It says it's before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was evidently set forth, crucified among you. And then he goes on to show the senselessness of going back to the law of Moses, knowing that the law could not save. Until today, the law does not save. Why? The law never empowers anyone to live right. The law only shows you what you ought to do. It doesn't give you the power to do it. The law only shows you where you missed it. It doesn't have the power to bring you back to the place of righteousness and rectitude. The law can only tell you Man should do this. Man should not do this. You must be righteous. But the law, the ceremonies, do not have the power to transform your life. Make you right. Make you righteous. Make you godly and make you holy. But it is when we come to the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, who bore our sin, who took away our condemnation, and who empowers us because he lives in us, believers. And because he lives in us, what the law could not do, 
the life that the Lord could not transform, the Christ in us now lives right, righteous, upright in our lives. And so, if we are wise, if we are not foolish like those thoughtless Galatians, we will switch on to Christ, surrender our lives to Christ, submit our lives to Christ, and let Him enter us, dwell in us, abide in us, and as He enters us, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice, and he turns away from the law of Moses, and he closes the door against the law of Moses. He opens the door to the Redeemer. He opens the door to the Deliverer. He opens the door to the one who can change us and cleanse us and purge us and purify us and turn us to become new creatures in Christ. He opens his heart. He opens his life. He says, Lord, I cannot do it by myself. And the law of Moses cannot do it for me. And the ceremonies of the law cannot do it for me. But thou and thou alone must say, He comes in. He dwells within us. He transforms our lives. He changes our lives. And then we become the children of God, the converts to Christ, and the children of Abraham by faith. Tonight, the message is justification and acceptable righteousness before God. How does man become justified? How does man have acceptable righteousness in the sight of God? That's what the verses tonight are talking about. Justification and acceptable righteousness before God. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the foolishness of reverting to the law. Coming out of that law and the Jewish religion and the religion that cannot save and then going back reverting to the law the foolishness the thoughtlessness the senselessness and the carnality of reverting to the law number two the faithfulness of reliance on the lord the faithfulness you're full of faith you understand faith you accept faith and you accept what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary and faithfully, honestly, confidently, trustfully, you come to the Lord and you rely completely on Him. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. I look to the Lord who alone can save that's faithful and it will be fruitful too in our lives. Point number three, the faith for righteousness in all lands. In the land of Israel, in the land of the Gentiles, here is the faith, here is the only way that gets us into righteousness because of the Redeemer and because of what he has done. Now, whether it's in Israel, or in the gentle world, in the, among the blacks, among the whites, anywhere we find ourselves now, anywhere we are born, whatever our culture, and whatever our nationality, the only way to have righteousness is through faith in Christ. Number three, the faith for righteousness in all lands. Number one, Number one is the foolishness of reverting back to the law. There are three things there. Number one, the foolishness of backsliders departing from divine truth. Number two, the fickleness 
of the beguiled, those who are deceived, uh, into deadly transgression. Number three, the falling of bondage to that mean uh, traditions. Let's look at number one there. Number one there, the foolishness of backsliders departing uh, from uh, divine truth. Look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has derailed you? Who has deceived you? Who has cajoled you? Who has pulled you away from the truth? And then brought you to the law. The law that can only damn your soul. Foolish Galatians, senseless Galatians, thoughtless Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth. The apostle had set forth the Lord Jesus Christ before them as the only Savior, as the only shepherd and bishop of our souls, as the only redeemer, as the only day star that can bring us and reconcile us unto God. It was evident among them, and they believed, and they were saved, and they were redeemed, and they were born again. But now somebody came to beguile them, bewitch them, deceive them, and yet Christ had been shown to be crucified among them. That's why he said in chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, looking at verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, perverted gospel, upside down gospel, a derailed gospel. He said, I marvel. You have been brought into the grace of God. You were saved. You were born again. A definite transformation took place in your life. I marvel now because of what I see. Look at verse 7. It says in verse 7, which is not another. Another gospel, which is not another. There is only one gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him, a Jew or a Gentile, will not perish but have everlasting life. He said, the gospel that some people have introduced you to, another gospel. Really, it's not another because there's no other gospel. He says, but there will be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Verse 8, in verse 8 he says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, the gospel that does not base salvation on Christ, on the Lamb of God, on the grace of God, on the revelation of Christ dying for us, on the cross of Calvary, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which, he have, which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Chapter 4, verse 9. In chapter 4, verse 9, but now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, the backslid. They turned away from the Lord. 
they gave up the assurance they had in the Lord. They knew before only Christ can save. We live righteous only by the grace of the Lord. Only by coming to the Lord did we have any light, eternal life, redemption, reconciliation, righteousness, the righteousness of faith. But now, after you knew God, and after God knew you as his own child, how turned you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Chapter 5, reading from verse 7. In chapter 5, verse 7, ye did run well when you accepted Christ, when you believed in Christ, when you internalized the message of Christ, when you were converted, when you walked in the way of the Lord, when you walked in the truth, when you held to Christ, and Christ alone at that time, ye did run well. Who did hinder you now? That ye should not obey the truth. That's the message for every backslider. That's the message for anyone that was in the truth. And now he goes to maybe an assembly and a fellowship. He goes to a congregation that, do not that does not have the truth of the gospel. And he's there with them doing this and doing that. And he has forgotten or she has forgotten everything she ever knew about Christ the Savior. Now they must take him or take her to this place and that place. And it's a ceremony they perform. It's a ritual they do that she has confidence in here in there today. That's backsliding. And the Lord is saying, how can you become so foolish and so senseless and so thoughtless? You knew the truth. You walked in the truth. But now you've gone astray. I pray every such person will come back in jesus name look at number two here number two here the fickleness of beguile of the beguiled into deadly transgression look at galatians chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 2 this only what i learn of you received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith was asking them now. And is the reason why, as you hear the word of God, if I ask you a question there, you answer in your heart. Or if I don't have the question, you ask yourself the question. When you are born again, the Spirit of God bore witness with your heart. Was it through circumcision, or through offering an animal, or through burning a candle, or through whatever rituals of the law, or was it through faith? The answer, through faith. And when you came to the Lord, and the Lord witnessed in your heart, and you were transformed, and your life was changed, was that through the work of the law? Was that through the rituals of the Mosaic ceremony? The answer is no. It's by faith in Christ. That's why he said they were fickle. They were weak. They were unstable because they allowed themselves to be beguiled into deadly transgression. Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Where is the boasting there? It is excluded by what law? Of works, saved by works, transformed by works, redeemed by works, assured of heaven by works, he said, nay, but by the law of faith, 
by the principle of faith, by the oppression of faith. In verse 28, he says, Therefore, we conclude that a man, whether the man is a Jew or a Gentile, we conclude, and there is no contradiction to this conclusion, this is definite. For now and for all generations, for the time present and for the time to come, the conclusion is final that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Verse 29. In verse 29, you see the God of the Jews only. You see not also of the Gentiles, yes, of the Gentiles also. And then in verse 30, in verse 30, it says, Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith, not by the law, the circumcision, the Jewish, and all those people of the old covenant by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. We're looking at number three here. Number three, the folly of bondage to damning traditions. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish? Are you so carnal? Are you so fecal? Are you so thoughtless? You see, there are people who do not think through of the faith they have, of the fruit of the gospel they have believed. And so, Paul the apostle said, this is folly. This is foolishness. This is senselessness. This is thoughtlessness. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, conversion, you've begun in the spirit. Opening your hearts to the truth, you've begun in the spirit. Looking unto Christ and Christ alone, your Savior, you began in the spirit, walking by faith, living by faith, and doing everything God ordains by faith. You began in the spirit, having begun in the spirit. Are ye now made perfect by the flesh as you have begun of the Lord? Are you now made perfect by the law? Look at chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 9. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather, are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be, to be in bondage. You were in bondage before. Christ came and liberated you and set you free. But now you want to go back to bondage again. And this kind of bondage you are going into now is greater, is deeper, is more terrible than the bondage you were even in when you were Gentiles. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, he observed days and months and times and years they went back to circumcision and they went back to all the uh, separated sacred holy days of the gentile of the jews and then in verse 10, in verse 11 it says i'm afraid of you lest i bestowed upon you live upon you labor in vain Look at chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Chapter 5, verse 1, stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, don't allow the pressure of those traditional people to bring you into bondage. Christ has set you free, and so abide 
and so remain in that liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again of the yoke of bondage. Verse 2. In verse 2, behold, I, Paul, the apostle, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. If after you have been saved, you are born again, you are made righteous, you are redeemed, you are reconciled unto God, if you allow the Jews, the traditionalists, the Pharisees, the Sadducees to put pressure on you, and you do not allow the grace of God in you to make you stand, and you go back to be circumcised because you want to obey the laws of the old covenant. I say unto you that ye, if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Look at verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. In verse 4, it says, Christ has become of no effect unto you. The joy you had in Christ, the change of life you had in Christ, and the conversion you had in Christ, and the testimony you gave uh, that you belong to Christ, all that will now be in vain. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are falling from grace. I pray you will not fall from grace. Did you hear? I said, I pray that you will not fall from grace. Just to go back to the old tradition and to all the laws of the Jewish people, of the traditional people, of the rigidly religious people, and their faith, their minds, and not now anymore on Christ. It is not for them what Christ has done that matters. It is what they do, the circumcision, the observance of times, of days, of months, of years, the things they do. That's what matters to them now. They are falling from grace. I pray you will stand firm at the center of the grace of God and the goodness of God will abide and remain in your life in Jesus' name. You will not be under any pressure by anyone to depart from the truth, from the gospel, from the faith once delivered unto the saints. We're coming to number two here. Point number two, the faithfulness of reliance, relying on the Lord. There are three things here. Number one, the apostles' remembrance of former fortitude in the furnace. Number two, abundant reports through the foundation of faith. Number three, Abraham's righteousness by faith and faithfulness. Let's look at number one here. The apostles' remembrance of their former fortitude in the forties. Look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 4. Have you suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain, the apostle remembered that these were genuine converts. These were people that really came to the Lord and as a result of coming to the Lord and believing in the Lord, they suffered persecution. But they held on courageously. They had fortitude, firmness, and courage, boldness, even in the furnace of persecution. 
Have you suffered so many things in vain? Remember your life. Remember when you were born again. Remember the persecution. Remember how you said, come with me. No matter what they do, no matter what they say, here I stand. I will not go back to the rituals anymore, to those ceremonies anymore. I will not go back to that gang anymore. I will not go back to that occultism anymore. You stood firm now. If after you stood like that, in the furnace of persecution, if now you are bewitched, you are deceived, and you are jolted, and you go back to what will not save. Have you suffered so many things in vain? If it yet be in vain, what kind of things did they suffer? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days which in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Remember what you suffered at that time. Do you ever recall that? Do you ever bring to mind your earlier days in Christ when you were born again? How you loved the Bible? How you loved the word of God, how you lived for Christ and lived in righteousness, how all your friends, so many of your friends, how they turned their backs on you, how your family, how they turned their backs on you, how co-workers turned their backs on you, and yet joyfully you endured because you know you have everlasting life. And whatever you are facing today cannot be compared with what you faced when you first became a real child of God. Have you forgotten? Call to remembrance the former days. Call to remembrance. Look at verse 38 there in uh, chapter 10. Verse 38. Now, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, the pressure is coming, maybe at home. The pressure is intense for the co-workers. The pressure is great in the market that you will come and join them. The things, the sacrifices you are forsaking, the pressure is now much, remember, to keep in the faith, abide in the faith. Because if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Those who draw back from faith to foolishness, from faith to fickleness, from faith to the law of Moses, from faith to denominational tradition. Those who draw back, they draw back into perdition. But we are them that believe unto the saving of the soul. You will not turn back. You will abide in the Lord ever in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two, abundant reports through the foundation of faith. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 5. It says, He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. I want you to notice something here. The present tense, he therefore that ministereth. There was still the minister, the preacher, the expounder of the word, still ministering unto them. He 
that ministereth unto you the Spirit. Not only that, and walketh miracles among you. Among them, there was chill, mighty, powerful, spirit filled ministers ministry to them and working miracles among them and yet they turned away from the present ministers and present miracle workers and the present shepherds and the present teachers of the world and they were lending their ears to the apostates the backsliding preachers and the Jewish corruptors wanting to corrupt them. That's why Paul said, you've got great opportunity and great privilege. It's not that the Lord has even withdrawn the teachers from you. He therefore that ministered to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you doeth, present tense, doeth, present time, doeth each by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Of course, by faith, by faith. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 4. God also bearing them witness, both of signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his will. For those Galatians, it was unfortunate for them that all the great things the Lord was doing at that time in their midst, they didn't take it to heart. That's why Paul the Apostle said, you're thoughtless. You're not looking at what's happening around you, among you. And the people, the ministers, the preachers who are making those things to happen, they are not making those things happen by the works of the law. They're doing it by faith. Why don't you then reason and bring back your senses and understand that it is God who is confirming, who is working those miracles according to his own will by the power of the Lord. Acts chapter 6 verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people, full of faith, full of faith, full of faith. It is by faith, not by the works of the law. And if anyone, after seeing the power of God manifested, he already seen that miracles are performed and the works of Christ are done by faith. Yet, if it will not go by faith, if it will go by, is going to the mountain. And on the mountain there, he wants to have power. Is that by faith or by works? Or is going to fast for 40 days? Is that by faith or by works? Or is going to get some occultic power? And is going to bond some things together? And it's not depending on Christ and Christ alone. That's not by faith. The people that work miracles for the glory of God, for the deliverance of those who are oppressed is by faith and not by works. And Stephen, full of faith and power, the great wonders and miracles among the people. Look at Romans chapter 15, verse 19. Chapter 15, verse 19. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. Not by works, not by ceremony, not by tradition, not by circumcision, not by the law of Moses, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached 
the gospel of Christ. Verse 29. In verse 29, and I am sure that when I come to you, I will not be coming with the law of Moses. I will not be coming with ceremonial law. I will not be coming with the burning of this incense or, or candle. I will not be coming with the Jewish ceremonial law. But I will come to you by faith and I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. I pray that the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ will abide with you in Jesus' name. Will abide with me. Will abide with me and abide with your family. And every problem in your family, every challenge, faith in Christ is able to remove everything the Lord will give you or your expectation by faith in Jesus' name. Let's look at number three here. Number three, Abraham's righteousness by faith and faithfulness. Look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's how it comes. Salvation by faith, righteousness by faith, assurance by faith, steadfastness in the Lord by faith. And all it means is, you know, the work is done. Christ has died for you. And you believe and stand in that everything God did in the life of Abraham, he will do in your life. Romans chapter 4, we're looking at verse 3. <coughs> Romans chapter 4. Reading from verse 3, for what says the scripture? That's the question to ask every time, not what says the Pharisee, what says the scribes, what says the Sadducees, what says the traditionalist, what says the denomination, what says your persecutors, what says the scriptures? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And whatever the scripture says, that's what you go by. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And you today, you believe God. He has given his only begotten son and he has pointed to him that is the only savior. And as you believe, like Abraham believed, you have heaven's righteousness. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it says, Now, to him that walketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. In verse 5, but to him that walketh not, but believeth on him, that justifies the ungodly, justifies the ungodly, his faith, his faith, his faith is counted for righteousness. You believe in the Lord? I said you believe in the Lord? That faith is counted for righteousness in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 4 verse 21. In Romans chapter 4, verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. What he had promised is able also to perform. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you. I said, and take you. Where is he? And take you unto myself. Do you believe that? I said, do you believe that? Sometimes Satan might come to whisper in your ears. Are you sure you are going to heaven? Do you think you are going to heaven? Do you imagine you are going to heaven? I don't imagine. I don't think. I know. I know I'm going to heaven. 
I said, I know I'm going to heaven. Why? Being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Sometimes the question will come, this trial will come, this temptation will come, this challenge will come, this persecution will come. Do you think you will stand? No, I don't think I will stand. I know that I will stand. I know that I will stand. You will stand. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not fear what man shall do unto me. Be fully persuaded, fully persuaded that he, that what he had promised is able also to perform. He'll perform in your life. He will do it in your life. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Verse 23, and it says, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. Verse 24, it says, But for us also. For me also, for me also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe. Not if we go back to the law. If we believe. Not if we are circumcised again. If we believe. Not if we go to put our necks under the yoke of the Mosaic law. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. I pray the Lord will impart, impute his righteousness upon you as you believe in Jesus' name. Point number three now. Point number three, the faith for righteousness in all lands, in all lands, in the Jewish land, in the Gentile land, everywhere, the faith for righteousness in all lands. Three things here. Number one, imperfect righteousness by the law. Number two, imputed righteousness from the Lord. Number three, impactful righteousness in our lives. Let's look at number one. Number one, imperfect righteousness by the law. We're looking at um, Hebrews chapter 7, reading from verse 11. Hebrews 7 verse 11, if therefore perfection were by the Levit Levitical priesthood, for under each the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Here Paul the Apostle again asking the Hebrew Christians and he said, If perfection were to come by the Levitical priesthood, by the law of Moses. How then will he give us another priest after the order of Melchizedek? Look at verse 19. In verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect. And the law made no one perfect. Make nothing perfect. It is faith. The perfects is righteousness in us. Going back to the law is going to punish yourself unnecessarily and is going to bring you under yoke unnecessarily because the law cannot perfect you. If you are here and you say, well, I've been here now for some months and some years and I don't like this in my life. I don't like this in my life. If you are not perfected, where you are hearing of faith, 
It's not the fault of the faith. It's your fault. You're not taking it to heart. You're not looking at Christ. The way you ought to look at Christ, the author and the finisher of your faith. And going to the place where you have tradition and ceremony and circumcision and uh, rituals and all that, it will worsen your situation. You'll be totally uh, emptied of strength and grace and power because perfection does not come from outside Christ. Verse 19, it says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which were drawn nigh unto God. I pray Christ will perfect you. The Lord himself will perfect you. You know, in yourself, in your own power, you cannot perfect yourself. Then they not knew that. And the Lord is not pushing you away from that. He says, come. You could not perfect yourself. The Lord cannot perfect you. That's why I canceled the first covenant, the old covenant. I've established the new covenant now. Come. You will perfect everything concerning your life. Look at Second Chronicles chapter 25, verse 2. Second Chronicles chapter 25, verse 2. Look at something here. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. That's where some people stop. They say, I'm all right. I'm doing everything. I have the courage. I have the constitution. I have the stamina. I have the stability, I have the strength to do everything that is right. Read everything. It says, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. You see, you have to come back to Christ. He is the one that will take you beyond where you are now and then he'll make you to do it with a perfect heart. Look at this man, verse 14. In verse 14, now it came to pass. After that Amaziah, that the man was come from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods, the idols of the children of Seir, and set them up to be his gods. This is the man, he did things right, but not with a perfect heart. And he thought it was self-sufficient, a self-made man, a self-righteous man, a self developed man a do it yourself man but then his heart had not been perfected and so he went to battle he overcame in that battle and now he came back with the gods of the people and he bowed down himself before them and turned and burnt incense unto them look at verse 15 in verse 15 therefore the anger of the lord was kindled against amaziah and he sent unto him a prophet which said unto him that why hast thou sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand verse 16 in verse 16 and it and it came to pass as he talked with him that the king amaziah said unto him a thou mage of the king's counsel forbear why shouldest thou be smitten then the prophet forbear and said i know that God has determined to destroy thee because thou hast done this and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. There are people that have initial grace of God. 
their seed. And they do that which is right. But their hearts are not perfected yet. And instead of going to God and being perfected, they are running here and there. No more prayer. No more reading of the Bible. No quiet time. No intimacy with God. No asking the Lord and waiting on the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. No renewal. And they're just like that. And they walk and walk and walk. And the grace of God is not increasing, multiplying in their lives. They're satisfied. And then if they take any wrong step, and you're saying, and the Lord sends a prophet, a counselor, a leader to them, why are you doing this? They say, do I need your counsel? Do I need your advice? And do I need any scripture again? I want to tell you, I'm saved, I'm saved. That's what Amaziah did. But the Lord is saying that we come to Christ for perfection. Whatever the Lord has done in our lives, so far, so good. But we come back to Him for perfection. If we're saved, we come back for sanctification. And if we're already sanctified, we come back for the power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. The Lord Jesus Christ knew what He was saying when He said, Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be a deal with power from on high. He knew they were saved. Their names were written in heaven. He knew they were sanctified. He prayed for them. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He knew that they were to preach the gospel. He said, as my father have sent me, even so have I sent you. And yet, he said, tarry, wait in the city of Jerusalem, even though you are saved, even though you are sanctified, until ye be endued with power from on high. It says, for ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. He wants us to come back and come back and come back. He has filled us. He wants to refill us. He has formed us. He wants to form us into newer creatures again. He has fulfilled his promises in our lives. He wants to fulfill more promises in our lives. Don't be self-sufficient and think, I know it all, I've got it all. I pray that the Lord will perfect what he has started in our lives in Jesus' name. Did I hear any amen there? Look at number two now. Number two, the imputed righteousness from the Lord. We're coming back to Galatians chapter 3 from verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. You come to God, you submit to God, you yield yourself to God, you open your heart to God, you dedicate yourself to God, you consecrate yourself to God, you lay all on the altar and you believe the Lord that what the Lord has promised he is able to fulfill, is able to take the stony heart out of our flesh is able to give us the heart of flesh is able by his power divine power to give us all things pertaining to life and godliness he is able by his promise and provision to give us the very nature of christ the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world is able to make us peculiar people 
people zealous unto good works is able to impute is able to impart his righteousness into our lives look at romans uh, verse 7 here galatians chapter 3 verse 7 it tells us know ye therefore that they which are of the same of the of faith the same are the children of abraham they are of faith they believe that's why they were converted they believe that's why they consecrate more everything they know everything they have everything they possess unto the lord and they labor by faith they walk by faith they live by faith they plan by faith they envision the future by faith everything they do they do by the face of the son of god who loved them and gave himself unto them it says in romans chapter 4 reading from verse 11 romans chapter 4 verse 11 and he received the sign of circumcision is a seal of the righteousness of faith a seal a token of the righteousness of faith which he had yet being uncircumcised it wasn't the circumcision that brought the faith he had the faith when he was yet uncircumcised that he might be the father of all that believe the father of all that believe and the father so the son so the daughter and as he becomes a father we are able to manifest the same kind of faith that he manifested that he might be the father of all them that believe though they be not circumcised we don't have to go back to the law of moses that righteousness might be imputed unto them also that righteousness might be imputed unto them also that the same righteousness that made Abraham acceptable in the sight of the Lord, that that same righteousness that makes us accepted in the beloved, acceptable in the kingdom, that makes us and assures us that we're children of God, that our names are written in heaven, and that our lives are transformed, that that kind of righteousness approved of God and given by God might be imputed unto us also just by faith. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be seen for us, the seen offering, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He took our sin upon him so that we'll take his righteousness upon us and exchange. We had sin, he had righteousness, and when he died for us on the cross of Calvary, we made an exchange. As we believed in him, we transferred all our sins on Christ by faith. He transferred all his righteousness on us by faith. He made him to be seen for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now our sins are taken away and we have his righteousness. And the Father in heaven does not look at us as miserable, wretched, depraved, condemned sinners. He looks at us as justified, saved, ransomed, reconciled, renewed, righteous people of God. Thank God I am one of them. I say, thank God I'm one of them. As you believe that righteousness is imputed in your life in Jesus' name. In Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, 
and I'm reading from verse 9. It says, and be found in him, not outside him. If you crawl out to tradition, you'll be outside Christ. If you crawl out to the law of Moses, you'll be outside Christ. If you crawl out to the old style of worship, old pattern of worship, the candle, the white garment, the incense, washing and bathing by the riverside, and you abandon the blood of Jesus, if you crawl out and you go to the mountain, you're thinking it's that mountain that will give you what you need in God. If you crawl out into tradition, if you crawl out into occultism, if you crawl out to the power of Satan, you'll be outside Christ. But it is when you remain in him and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. We have all things in Christ. I said we have all things in Christ. Righteousness in Christ, redemption in Christ, justification in Christ, sanctification in Christ, power in Christ. And then we have the glory that is to come. We have everything in Christ. Abide in Christ. All will be yours in Jesus' name. Number three here. Number three, the impactful righteousness in our lives. Romans chapter 5 verse 17. For if by one man's offense, death range by one. Much more they that receive the abundance of grace. Abundance of grace coming to you tonight in Jesus' name. And of the gift of righteousness. Gift. It is not something we pay for. It's not something we sweat for. It's not something we labor for. The righteousness coming from God and he has abundance of that and he gives that to us as a gift. The gift of righteousness we shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Gift of righteousness. I say gift of righteousness will make you to reign in life. I will reign in life. Not at death, not after death, in life. In this present life, you will reign. You reign over every obstacle, over every challenge, over every walk of the devil, every challenge. If any challenge is there tonight, I'm telling you the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness coming upon your life as you accept, as you embrace, as you believe. And you say, yes, Lord, I know everything I need is in Christ. He's giving me the grace. He's giving me the gift. You'll walk out of this place to reign in life in Jesus' name. And all those sins of the past in your life that put your nose on the, in the mud, that made you to fall, and that made you to be ashamed of yourself, and that kind of, uh, you know, defeated you, and trampling upon you, you rise up in faith. You rise up in strength. And you will reign in life in Jesus' name. I will reign. I said, I will reign. Now, kings who reign, they don't go out in fear and timidity. They know they are kings and they know they are royalty. And when they go out, they go out with confidence, knowing they are going to reign because of the position they hold and because of the righteousness the Lord has given you and because of the grace and the gift the Lord has given you, you go out with the confidence. So the assurance you are going to reign. I am going to reign. And even the people that see you, they'll say, I want to be like brother so-and-so. 
I want to be like sister so and so and then as they come to you the same grace you have and the same strength you have you'll pass on to them in Jesus name look at Daniel chapter 12 we're looking at verse 3 Daniel chapter 12 we're looking at verse 3 it says and they that be wise they that be wise are there wise people here today I said that there are wise people here today. You know, the Galatians, that's what they lost. Oh, foolish Galatians who has bewitched you. They were not wise. They were righteous before, but then somebody came to them and bewitched them and turned them back to the law and to all that circumcision. But now, as you remain in the Lord, and you remain in the righteousness of the Lord, whereby the Lord has made you free. You remain wise, and then you are telling all the people to come out of their foolishness, to come out of their f f folly, and to come out of their fickleness, and to come into faith in Christ, you turn them from what they want to what they ought to be. Great will be your reward in heaven in Jesus' name. And they that be wise shall shine at the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness at the stars forever and ever yeah. you'll be there yeah. I said you'll be there yeah. the past the Lord will cleanse the present the Lord will renew and the future will be brighter than the shining star yeah. why don't you rise up and tell the Lord and say Lord I thank you, everything I need, justification, salvation, conversion, sanctification in your life, everything I need, righteousness and grace and gift, everything I need to reign in life is in Christ. I receive him afresh again and more again in my life today. Victory, triumph will be yours the rest of your life in Jesus' name.